Think of any 80s banger song that you love. Living on a Prayer. Dude Looks Like a Lady. I Hate Myself for Loving You. The list goes on and on. And not just the 80s. The 80s was probably the most prolific time, I guess. But into the 90s, the 2000s, even very recently. That's right. My my first hit was I Was Made for Loving You with Kiss, no. which I co-wrote with Paul Stanley. No big deal. And that was in the 70s. So then I went on to work with uh, Bon Jovi, Aerosmith, Joan Jett, Alice Cooper, um, Aerosmith. I can't. And uh, <laughs> Michael Bolton. Um, and then came the next era when I hooked up with Ricky Martin and helped to collaborate on Living La Vida Loca. Crazy. Uh, she Bangs, Shake Your Bon Bon. Crazy. Right. The, I mean, sometimes I life. forget yeah. when I'm hanging out with you, like, like people will say, oh, my gosh, you know, I, yeah, he's Desmond. But it is your your library. I, I mean, it has to be in the thousands. Yes. To, the, you mean of the dollars? songs you've written? <laughs> well, like, Tom, Tom, let's it's, up it a little bit more <laughs> than thousands. OK, <laughs> no, but you, like how many songs have you count? You've counted that you've written. I mean, I'm sure you did for the book. I haven't measured. All right. I've never measured. Oh, and using a musical term and everything. <laughs> <laughs> I bet you've met. I'm pretty sure you've no, measured. I, I think I've written about 4,000 songs in my lifetime, but it's a long lifetime. I'm, I'm going to be celebrating my 70th birthday coming up next month. So I've, I've been working since I was a teenager. So I've never looked back. You do have this book coming out September 19th. It chronicles all of it. So... Um, your life has been so full. And what I want to say is I got to see your, I got to go to Greece with you last year for your That's big right. show at the Parthenon. And as we were, as I've always been amazed by you as a semi-creative myself, and I think a lot of people echo in this town, is that like, you're still, you never rest. You no. still are so inspired. You inspire creatives to continue to do it for the sheer love of it. No rest for the wicked. That's yeah. what I say. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And as long as Diane Warren is in her office on a Saturday writing a hit, then I have to be. Yeah. <laughs> That's what I say. I mean, the book, you, there's so much you're working on, a Broadway musical. You're always, you're so creative. And as we mentioned, you know, your songs, you most recently you had a hit with Ava Max, Kings and Queens. Like, you're still writing. You're still, you know, like, I'm sorry, I'm on the phone with Babs. I'm writing her a song. <laughs> I just do want to start with your origin story because it's so compelling and you mentioned your big 70th birthday and what your mom meant to you in your life and how mm -hmm. you took responsibility on so early before we get into the hits well my mom was cuban and she had come over to the united states with her first husband in the early 1950s so it was way before the um the exodus, the, the, the Cuban revolution, and then all of the exiles that landed in Miami. So we were already here, ready to receive all of my relatives. And so, you know, I just grew up with a tribe of cousins and my brother and all of these kids. And our parents worked at the hotels on Miami Beach. And they were waiters and waitresses. Uh, these were people who, you know, went to, uh, you know, fancy schools and played polo <laughs> never in their lives would, would they ever think that they'd end up being waiters and waitresses and so um i i grew up in the cuban exile community and we lived in the projects uh called liberty city i don't know if you remember that movie called moonlight yes those were the projects and so they're still there <laughs> and so my mom was a single mom and uh, she was always working, but she was a songwriter and a poet, and her name was Elena Casals, and she's known as La Musa. And so um, when she passed, I helped to co-found the Latin Songwriters Hall of Fame, which people can look up, and uh, we have the La Musa Awards, and uh, we've been going for 10 years strong. And, and so I, I helped to create it after my mom passed uh, 11 years ago. And um, I'm very dedicated to my mother, even, you know, as after she's gone. I mean, she's very much alive 
for me because she really, you know, inspired me not only to be an artist and she gave me that in, innate talent, maybe through DNA, but her hustle, mm -hmm. you know, because it, it really takes both talent and hustle. Mm -hmm. You have to have almost more hustle than talent yeah. to make it. Well, the subtitle of this podcast is The Nashville Truth. And while I was thinking about this too, I, I you know, I live on Broadway and you think about how many nights on that street where dreams are made of, the dreams you had, you know, coming up as a Cuban exile in that community, like how many nights living on a prayer is played on Broadway? I think I've texted you drunk from Broadway. <laughs> well, it's your song, dude. My, my sons uh, went out with some of their frat brothers um, just a few months ago. And they, I think they went to Kid Rocks and I think there's a band on like every floor. Yeah. And so they, I mean, I don't know. they each went and asked the band to play Living on a Prayer. So at one point, the whole building was rocking Living oh on a Prayer. God, How funny is that? I love that. Is that a I great love those. prank? Yeah, that's I great. Love it. That's great. But it is the, it is the, it, the truth of the music industry, the truth of achieving what you've achieved like when you think about Nashville, what is like the Desmond Child Nashville truth? Well, after rock music, the kind that I was writing, the anthemic rock music of the 80s, all it took was one song, Smells Like Teen Spirit. And suddenly VH1 was playing nothing but Nirvana and grunge. And all of the bands that I worked with weren't getting played anymore. That genre just completely from one day to the next completely dried up. I guess so, I didn't do the math on that was the moment. I was love the that moment. you know that. You're so right. And so um, I was thinking to myself, well, where do I go next? And I went to some, you know, bar in, in the valley in, in, in Los Angeles. It was kind of a Western bar. And I heard this music. I, I said, well, that sounds like Bon Jovi. But wait a second. The singer has a twang. Oh my God, that's Garth Brooks. Oh yeah. And so I said, Nashville, here I come. <laughs> Cause it sounds like my kind of music with a twang. Yeah. So the first thing I did was I met Victoria Shaw. Who we love. Because you know, my hustle was my strategy was to get on a Garth Brooks album. Mm -hmm. So um, she was so welcoming and so wonderful. And our families are very close and still are. And we wrote our very first song called Where Your Road Leads. And that became a duet between Garth Brooks and Trisha Yearwood. And uh, that, that was a wonderful thing to happen to me because right off the bat, I got a Garth Brooks cut. Mm -hmm. So I set my intention and it happened. And so I continued to write with Black Hawk and for Ty Herndon and, you know, whatever I could while, you know, at the same time I had moved to Miami and I was working in Latin music there and met Ricky Martin and collaborated with Draco Rosa. And we came up with the cup of life, which he sang at the Grammys, live in La Vida Loca. She bangs, shake your bonbon. Nobody wants to be lonely. I can. And his records, the, 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 those two, I think it was uh, Sound Loaded and the previous one, Ricky Martin. Between the two of them, they sold about 30 million records. So I, I had it going on over there. Suddenly I had four studios going on the same block. I bought up four houses, put my mom in one of them. And uh, we were having just the best time until another big world turn of events, 9-11. Suddenly, nobody wanted to fly to Florida and the record companies, because of Napster and file sharing and all that, panicked. They weren't paying for anyone to fly to Florida work, to work with me. So uh, it was another kind of, what do I do with myself? Because the Latin music explosion moved on without me. Mm. And so that's when I started working with Clive Davis on the songs for American Idol, Kelly Clarkson. Mm -hmm. And I had the B side of a moment like this, which was really a double A side. So I got a great ride. Mm -hmm. um, 
And uh, then I worked with Carrie, yeah. Carrie Underwood and, oh my God, Jennifer Hudson. I mean, all of those, um, Bo Bice. Oh, I remember Bo Bice. I love Bo Bice. He's great. I think he's, she's obviously still around town. I, I, you know, I told him, Bo, what you need to do is come up with a franchise, Bo Bice Chicken. <laughs> See, and you'd be all, all set. You know, like Jimmy Buffett, right? Margaritaville. This is how Bo Bice Chicken. This I said, make like a chicken shack and put a band in there and have the best fried chicken ever. Hot chicken. This is before Hattie B's, right? His brain never stops. No. And he didn't pay attention to me because, well, you know. He'll be sorry. He's probably I, sorry. I have a billion dollar idea every day. You know, it just doesn't, I don't have time to execute them. He's probably standing in line at Hattie B's like, Bo <laughs> does not buy chicken. <laughs> Bo's just waiting I in line. I love Bo Bice. And right. I would, I would eat Bo Bice chicken. <laughs> <laughs> That's so. the commercial. I would eat Bo, Bo Bice, Bice chicken, chicken, mama. <laughs> wow. So, um, you know, I'm still in country music. I publish and co-manage Drake, Drake. Mil Drake Milligan, who uh, broke out with America's Got Talent. I mean, before that, he played the young Elvis Presley in Sun Records, a CMT series. Yeah. And uh, he's doing fantastic. And he's going to be back on AGT. I think they're 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 bringing him back and they're, there's going to be an all star show. And, so and he's tough. all part of that. And he has new songs. And uh, his next single is Killer. I can't reveal what it is, but um, that's I keep a, my 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 boot in country music one way or or the other. Yeah. And I'm also producing uh, co-producing with Marty Fredrickson, the Rasmus oh, from Finland. Oh yes. So I'm in still in rock. It's it's kind of a Nordic, you know, kind of very. Nordic rock. He's so cool. And he reminds me of a, like a character from The Hobbit. You really have achieved the American dream of like, if you dream it, hustle, work hard enough, you know, you get enough breaks along the way. And certainly, you know, there have been moments where because of your sexuality, you haven't gotten bread, right? Like there's been it's the time I'm it's sure always, you got you know, a, a, cha I, a challenge. I grew up... Um, you know, I didn't really even learn how to speak English till I went to kindergarten. I was like five years old. Um, my mother just spoke Spanish around the house with my uncles and aunts. And we grew up in exile community. So we were foreigners. My mother barely spoke English. And um, then, of course, we were poor. And I also started to realize I was gay. So I had all of these things that were kind of stops. And I found a way to overcome them. And it's still a struggle. You know, it's, it doesn't go away, especially if you're in the LGBT community. So I wish people would just get over it. <laughs> it's, such Move a, on. it's such a boring so subject boring. for me. I mean, it's like, come on, people. But for real. <laughs> I mean, honestly. Yes. And so. Have you ever had someone say, oh, my God. You wrote that song like somehow because you were gay, you couldn't like live in on. Who was Gina? You know, <laughs> well, that's a different story. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know what I'm saying? At a though. certain period in my in my life. I had a girlfriend. I was in college, NYU, and she was working in a diner and they called her Gina. And her name is Maria Vidal, of course, and she's an artist in her own right. And we started our band Desmond Child and Rouge. So. Many years later, when I went to co-write with John Bon Jovi and Richie Sambora, we, we, we wanted to write a song about a, a working class couple, a struggling couple. And so I think John had in mind his friends from high school, Bonnie and Joe. And I had in mind uh, me and Maria. So that became Tommy and Gina. And Richie had in mind his own parents. And so we all brought our stories to that song. It's it's a wonderful song because it's more than a song. It's kind of a cultural event. Whenever they play it, people undoubtedly like jump up, fist in the air, you know, on that final modulation. Mm -hmm. And so um, I was once told that it was the most popular song performed at strip clubs and joints 
and 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 you know like bars and and you know all that in New Jersey it's as the final song because as soon as they jump up fist in the air they turn up the lights and they push everybody out see ya time to go <laughs> i lived in jersey i yeah, know you don't have yeah. to go home yeah. but you can't stay here we're closing <laughs> get out but i'm very proud of that fact <laughs> you should be i mean it really is like it's such a cultural anthem and speaks to that it's remains that like it is exciting to think of your sons who were in their early 20s to be at the bar and that it's still so significant in okay, our culture. When, when they did that, they were still using fake IDs. <laughs> I wasn't going to bring but that up. Those That's have right. did been you see ripped me? up. They're 21 now. Did you see so. me? I kind of paused. I was like, they're definitely 21 now. <laughs> Maybe not those, then. Those fake IDs came in handy. I didn't get them for yeah. them. I don't know how they got them, but they did. And so... Um, yeah, they're they're very proud of me, and I'm proud of them, and we're very proud of my, you know our papa, you know who's my husband, who raised them because I was away a lot, and he was the stay-at-home homemaker, and he's really the heart and soul of our family. I mean, I'll you know cry. him. Yeah, I'll cry. Yeah, I de I definitely think he's. Yeah, I mean, not only is he the kindest, sweetest person ever, but he's one of the most handsome. In Pretty fact, hot. when I met him, he looked like Brad Pitt. If only Brad Pitt was better looking. I'm not kidding. <laughs> I've, I've seen the pictures. They're in the book. The pictures are in the book. And, so, yeah. um, you know, we have a beautiful family and we're very proud of our family and we're, you know, exemplary people. Yeah, um, I think when you say people should get over it, when I say couple goals, you know, um, I, I look at you two as a, as a couple that has, you know, really fought to keep your family, to keep your community, to keep your friends close. It's really, insp again, inspirational. Well, we've been together now 34 years. <laughs> and so not that many straight people can say that. Mm -mm, no, right. <laughs> right. So, uh, But maybe we tried harder because of who we are and because we had to make sure that, you know, we were exemplary and be, be an inspiration to young LGBT people that are that are coming up and also to calm down their parents. It's like, you know, you're going to be able to have grandkids. Don't worry about it. Yeah. You know, so uh, encourage your kids to be themselves, whether they marry, whether they don't. It's just um, loving your kids is number one, not kicking them out of the house Yeah. because they don't conform, conform to whatever, you know, Somebody said somewhere in a in a in a scripture. Yeah. You know, so um, you know, it's it's amazing that it's taken this long for people to just forget about it and move on. But, you know, these days everybody's looking for somebody to hate and um, you know, we've just become scape wokes. Yeah. <laughs> I love that. Did you just make that up? I made that up. That's pretty good. That's good. Escape Wokes. You're, you're workshopping it right now? It's pretty I'm good. I like it. I like it. I'm, 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 I'm put, put it, putting that up the flagpole. I always was given solo artists to 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 work with and, and kind of androgynous um, artists like um, Alice Cooper, Joan Jett, Meat Loaf. Um, oh, yeah. You know, Ricky Martin. Um you know, uh, Ronnie Spector yeah. and, you know, all of these uh, kind of, um, you know, people that were, were not conforming, non-conforming. Aerosmith, yeah. Well, Aerosmith, exactly, yeah. with the song we wrote, Dude Looks Like a Lady. Yeah. And so that's, that's where I've made my, you know, my career. Was that controversial at the time? Was Dude Look Like a Lady? <laughs> Listen, it's funny because... I don't think anyone really thought that much about it. They just loved the way the song went and didn't yeah. think that deeply about it. Mm -hmm. And in those days, actually, there was more, you know, it was less of an issue. Mm -hmm. It's the politicians of today that are looking for something to hate, yeah. you know, that have uh, started picking on us. Mm -hmm. when but um, I was going to say about Dude Looks Like a Lady, um, what's wonderful about the song is that in that song, this, you know, this dude, this guy, normal working class guy walks into a bar on the shore. Her picture graced the grime on the door. And then 
um, she's up on stage and he fa falls in love with this Venus, you know, like creature on stage. And then he goes backstage and she pulls out her gun, tries to blow him away. And so he doesn't run away, though. <laughs> he goes, my funky lady, I like it, like it, like it, like that. So the beauty of that song is that second verse that says, never judge a book by its cover mm -hmm. or who you're going to love by your lover. Yeah. And which says, it, you know, it's like, let it go. Yeah. Let people be who they are. Don't judge it. What do you care? Just be yourself and, you know, and all that, which is the way the world should be. Yeah. When you go into that, right, with Stephen Tyler, was that the, that's the first song you wrote with yes, them? Yes, yes, with uh, Stephen and Tyler see, and Joe Perry. Yeah. yeah, and you guys, I can see you just totally, like, getting each other because he's, he's uh, I've interviewed him many times as well. Um, but talk to me about how that came about. I, I think people would be interested to know on the big songs, like, the impetus behind what inspired it. Well, when I first walked in, Stephen and Joe were working on a backwards loop that kind of sounded like a, I don't know, ACDC or something, kind of a harmonica part or, I don't know, ZZ Top or something. And it was like da-da, 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 right? And so um, Stephen said, you know, I, I, didn't, I hadn't even said a word. I just had walked in. He said, come over here. What do you think about this? And he starts singing, you know, da-da. Da -da, cruising for the ladies, da -da, da -da, cruising for the ladies. And then they stopped and they said, what do you think about that? And I said, that sucks. That's really bad. This is your first meeting of that? Yeah. And so then Joe crossed his arms and he's sort of like looking at me sideways. And Stephen's eyes you like opened up and, you know, I said, um, just to kind of break the ice, I said, I don't think Van Halen would put that on the B side of their worst record ah! just to see if I could get a laugh out of them. They weren't laughing. Oh, and, and I, and then Steven, who's more like a people pleaser kind of said, well, when I first started singing that riff, I was singing, dude looks like a lady. I said, what dude looks like a lady. And then Joe broke in and said, but we don't know what that means. I said, I know what that means. <laughs> <laughs> Hello. Yes. My name is Desmond so Child. I, I coaxed them into the storyline because it actually really happened. Stephen said he came up with it because he had gone to a bar with all of his, you know, crew and all that. And it was kind of an empty bar and there were they were in one corner. And at the end of this long bar in the corner by herself was this vision of loveliness, this ginormous platinum mullet <laughs> and uh, black nails and ivory skin and um you know this uh you know uh the, all of this uh jewelry and kind of a midriff with like a little curviness and all this kind of stuff and so they were kind of drawing straws on who was going to go up and uh you know hit on her mm -hmm. so suddenly she turns around and it's vince neal of motley crew and so then all of a sudden they were going, ooh, and then Stephen said, that dude looks like a lady. Dude looks like a lady. Dude looks like a lady. <laughs> and so they were kind of making fun, but that's where the hook came from. Wow. But I wanted, I wanted to say one more thing. When, I, when we were kind of doing a renovation in our house a few years ago, one of the workers came up to me and he said, so you wrote that song with Air Smith uh, called Do a Naked Lady? <laughs> so that was what he thought it was saying i will never and, and hear said, that the same way and again. i just went yeah yes 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 do a naked lady yeah <laughs> you know keep you know believing that that's the title i mean too much what i was saying earlier has anybody ever come up to you like and been like it didn't like they, they were truly shocked that you were gay and that you'd written some of these like you, like you're part of writing the thong song, <laughs> you know, uh, these these very uh, anybody ever said, wow, that's you. How did you tap into that? No, now? because it's that's probably I, too deep. I, I, I don't think. Well, first of all, I haven't really spoken about my sexual orientation with any of the bands that I work with. I mean, I, I didn't feel like I had to, they all knew and everybody knew Curtis and he'd pop his head in the, in the room and no need to talk about it. Yeah. It's like, who gives a fuck? Exactly. You know? So, um, 
you know, I, I just feel like, um, the, really the glass ceiling was unspoken. Mm -hmm. I just wasn't getting the jobs to produce the bands. Interesting. And then they, you know, after Bruce Fairburn passed away and he, he was producing Aerosmith and Bon Jovi, those big records, you know, Slippery When Wet, New Jersey. And then with Aerosmith, he was doing Permanent Vacation, Pump, um, you know, those records. And he passes away. So those bands had to scramble and find new producers. Mm -hmm. That's why there was a kind of a big gap between New Jersey and the next record. Ah. And they were also touring the world. Yeah. And so, the th but to find someone that had that kind of talent. And then I, you know, I kept, you know, wanting to raise my hand and said, I have that kind of talent. I could produce these records. Great. And you just didn't feel like you could or just no, I go on her. I could. They didn't think they didn't consider me. Yeah. So I went and made epic records like with Joan Jett. I hate myself for loving you. Mm -hmm. That to this day is Sunday night football theme. Love it. And Dolly Parton just cut that song and on her record rock stars coming up with Joan featuring Joan Jett. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, also, you know, like the album trash with Alice Cooper, nobody rocks harder than Alice Cooper and you know, poison and bed of nails. I mean, all of those songs, you know, were like rocking really hard. Mm -hmm. So I could have been doing that with the bands, Yeah. but it wasn't until the genre died that then I started getting, you know, be begging from the <laughs> bands. Well, write with us and you can produce it. It's like, dude, your genre is dead, man. Yeah. It's over. Re reinvent as you have done reinvent so many times. Reinvent or, you know, be, you know, try to become a legacy band and get out there and do the oldies circuit, yeah. you know, or do something like that. I, because once you establish yourself in a genre, people don't want you to change into other styles. They really don't. When people try to do that and try to seem modern when they really knew them a different way. They don't want that. That's been the beauty about, I, I was going to say your Nashville truth and this town even, it is not just country anymore it, at all. And very few songwriters, musicians, producers, artists have done what you've done, which is to cross so many boundaries, so many genres. I mean, what genre haven't you done? Gregorian chants? I don't, I don't care about genre. I care about the story. So if I meet somebody and they are in another genre like Ricky Martin uh, being in Latin. I mean, luckily I had my Latin roots and I, can sp I could speak Spanish and knew everything about Latin culture. Uh, but to me, I was just thinking about the story, his story. What does the Latin Elvis sing about? That's what was in my mind when I was co-writing with Draco Rosa. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, we wanted to write the Millennium Song from Hell. And we did live in La Vida Loca. It, you know, hit 1999 and crossed right into the next century. And so to me, it's never about genre. It's about story. Mm -hmm. And if you have story, you have something to sing about. And it can swing from, you know, look at um, Katy Perry. We, I co-wrote uh, Waking Up in Vegas with Andreas Carlson and Katy. She didn't even have a record deal at that time. And that song went from, you know, one company to the other. And then she finally got it out there. And it was the fourth single off of that amazing record that broke her big. And it still went to number one, even though it was the fourth single. Because that song had strength. So when I went to see Katy Perry in her new show, it's her residency in Vegas. She does a version of Waking Up in Vegas that's like Vegas swing. It's just like... Ooh. It's a whole other slower tempo. It's completely like different. Kind of Sinatra-esque, yes, old school. Yes, absolutely. I love that. And, uh, you know, it's so great because she's like, the, I don't want to get, you know, be a spoiler, but she's like this little Lilliputian and in, in like a giant, you know, teacup and all these kinds of things happen on stage. Uh, and so she's just like able to take even her own hit and move it into another genre. That's how talented she is. Mm -hmm. When you, when you think of this town in particular, the, you know, 
the multi-genre, is there something, I, I shouldn't, uh, this will be the longest answer ever. <laughs> like, what do you, what do you still want to take on that is like so different that people would be like, wow, I don't know what well, would be left. There are people that I would love to work with. Do you want me to yeah, list them? I'd it's love calling, it. calling out there. Listen to me, Adele, Sam Smith. Oh, I see that. Louis Capaldi. Oh, I see that too. Jake Wesley Rogers. Oh, you should. We know him. How come, Love. You can make that happen. Him. He's amazing. And, you know, we've texted back and forth. It never comes together. I just never tire of him. I mean, he's just fantastic. I mean, there are other people I would love to work with. I'd love to write a song with Sade. Oh. I know she's very shy and she doesn't do that and all that, but that's a dream of mine. Mm -hmm. I would have loved to have written with, co with, um, co-written with uh, George Michael. Mm -hmm. And I actually met him and it was the night before the Grammys of, of Vita Loca and we were up for three Grammys. So I ran into him and, and I invited him to our win or lose party and he showed up. That's so great. he was there all night, but I couldn't get him to, you God. know, to, uh, you know, ask me to co-write with him, you know, so. My sisters would have lost their shit. When I got to interview uh, Simon Le Bon from Duran Duran. Oh, I love Duran Duran. I didn't realize my sisters were like, oh my God, we And Depeche you. Mode, yep. hello. Yep. That love Depeche Mode. I mean, while I was doing all those kind of hard rock metal songs in the 80s, they were ruling European airwaves. Mm -hmm. the Brit pop sound of the 80s. That was kind of my... So it was Tears for Fears, Squiddy oh. Politty, you uh, know. Yeah. Um, Adam Ant. Go West. Yeah. Um, oh, my God. It, it's, it was like all, all of those, you know, Howard. those bands, The Cure. Yeah, you know, like, The Cure. I love... Oh, my God. Yeah. And then out of that, you know, came... Elvis Inet Costello. In, of course, him. And we made friends at an airport. A couple of months ago, so I'm it's hoping to a you, picture of that. Yeah, I, that's so weird. So um, then came the police, and in excess, and then came U2, and they, you know, they became like a, a different kind of rock, mm -hmm. you know, that wasn't based on blues. It was based on Celtic themes, and uh, well, and the police also had a lot of that island thing, mm -hmm. you know, like rocks and yeah. you know, it's like you know, the King of Pain, you know, all of that. That Fortress, was a huge... Fortress Around My Heart is one of my favorite songs of all time. Those were huge influences on me. And eventually they made it into the kind of pop music that I um, worked on, like a song like Save Up All Your Tears that uh, Diane Warren and I wrote for Cher, um, you know, had that kind of pulsing feeling of that song One or With or Without You oh. by uh, U2. Yeah. I mean... I always long to work with the British bands mm -hmm. and be part of that, like Human League. Mm -hmm. I mean, ah, oh, that was I would, my music. I mean, that's that you know, era. Was... The Eurythmics. Oh, all of that. You know, I actually did. I was going to say, you didn't you do one with Annie Lennox? No, no, with Dave Stewart. Okay. I, I wrote some songs with Dave Stewart and you know, Dream Come True. Mm -hmm. Love him, and he lives in Nashville too, by the way. Oh, I did not. Absolutely. Know that. Plot twist. Every, all roads lead to Nashville. That's right. That's what I'm saying. <laughs> exactly. All old town roads lead lead to Nashville. Well, and when you were speaking earlier about it's all about the story, that's what this town is all about. It's all about the story. Oh, Dua Lipa. Oh. Dua Lipa. BB Rexa. Those are artists that I long to work with. And I did get to co-write with Burt Bacharach for my solo record, Discipline. I wrote a song called Obsession that I did as a duet with Maria Vidal, the original Gina mm -hmm. of Living on a Prayer. And it's one of my proudest moments that, you know, that song and writing with him and all of that. I mean, I've had an incredible life. I, I really have, oh, you know. I hate that. I don't want it to end. We're getting close. Yeah, but look, hold on. I want you to bring up Find out all Kiss. about it right here. Bring up Kiss. Gene S Simmons calling you the song doctor. Yeah, This is well, amazing. Yeah. But this is my book. Boom. <laughs> Living on a prayer. Big songs, big life. And when, you're, and when you are on page, how many pages are in the book? Oh, I don't know. There's so a when you're on, when you start part four, you must say, "Oh, we're halfway there." <laughs> See the book? 
Yes, halfway there. Jeff yeah, Jeff. yeah. I'm I'm doing the audio book right now, and I'm I'm I, I'm past this. Oh, here's your look. Show you and but Curtis. it takes me hours to do like two pages. Look how cute. That's Kurt. That's with hair. Uh, before you go, this is the what we're gonna. I don't. I feel like we could go on forever. I love the the notes in the cover. I, I, it's so good, and I love you. But um, can I convince you to show a little bit of this? Because we also share this love of the Celtic. Yes. Game of Thrones. Love. Uhtred of Bebenberg. Uhtred of Bebenberg. We loves the Last Kingdom. The Last Kingdom. And so inspired. Destiny is all. <laughs> so inspired by that, you just went. To, to the, where the, the Bramberg Castle is, you know, Bebenberg became Bramberg, right? A uh, castle, the real castle. I know. I'm that they spent jealous. four seasons trying to win back, you know, right? And so I went there and there's a uh, tattoo master and, um, you know, it, it's, it's, um, he's, Viking, you know, he's originally Danish with the long red beard. Uh, you know, what's his name? Give him a shout Peter out. Peter Madsen. Mm -hmm. And he's just the best. And so when I was going through Instagram, you know, the, you know, looking at everything having to do with the last kingdom, uh, his stuff started coming up and his workshop is in um, a place called uh, Whitley Bay, north of Newcastle. So I've gone twice. Ooh, in Northumberland. Been... Yes, yes, Northumberland. Which is also where Sting is from. Yes, exactly. That's Tyn Tynemouth. Tynemouth. Yes, yes. And so I stayed at the Grand Hotel in Tynemouth. Oh. And it's it's like really creepy. <laughs> I love it. It look, feels so haunted. <laughs> I, I mean, it was so haunting because, I mean, this is a funny side story, but I was just there and... I sat down for breakfast and I looked over and there was a lady with her husband and she looked exactly like my mother. <gasps> and so I said, you know, you look so much like my mother. And then she looked at me and, you know, it was like we connected. And it turns out that her son lives in Nashville and Stop he's a it. singer songwriter. I can't with that. This is there. are no I accidents. mean, it's like no accidents. he just. It freaked me out. And then the next day when I ran into her in the lobby, she came, you know, kind of floated towards me and she looked at me and she said, go out there and have a happy life. Aww. So, you know, it touched me because mm -hmm. it felt like my mother was speaking through her. Mm -hmm. So that I was like, that. Um, you know, that place is haunted. Haunted AF. Haunted, I want to go. Haunted. I want to go. So I went and I went twice and all together was seven days and eight hour days. And then one of those days was 12 hour days because I had to go. And so they, you know, I really needed an extra day, but they got it done. And I'm just so, it's not know. your first tattoo though, right? No, no. I had my, my oh, son's yeah, that, names. That's right. Romans on this side, Nero's on that side. And that has a funny story too, because they were saying, daddy, don't do it. <laughs> and so finally I said, okay, you can do it, but you can't use our names. I said, well, who's else's names would I do it? <laughs> you know? So, Finally, I did it, and then they they liked it, but Roman would only hug me on his side, and Nero would only hug me on his side because they didn't want the other one's name to touch them. Oh, that's hilarious! <laughs> These kids are amazing. So, so that that's when I turned sixty. So for my seventieth, I went hog wild. What is that kind of like? You know, old age. Uh, what? Crisis. Yeah, middle age crisis. No, old age crisis. Oh, <laughs> well. <laughs> and so I'm still in denial. I got this amazing tattoo. I mean, it's. Can just... you? Do you mind showing a little bit of it? It's yeah. so. I love the way it looks. It, this is. An... This is the bear, and on the back I have the raven, and down my arm, I have the god mask, and then it's kind of like, it, you know. It goes all the way down. It wasn't supposed to go this far. I like but it. But once he started going, I it's just okay, keep going. And then I I didn't know it was gonna go all the way around. And you know, it goes wait. Dude, it, I love that. I like a good man hand tattoo. It's so I mean it's, it's just so like hot. it goes all the way around. I just gotta warn you, this nothing really hurt that much. Oh. This hurt. No. Right here. Just right here. I thought this my little Celtic tattoo, that's a sensitive area right there on the... There and a little bit here and here. 
But I mean, I it's called whinging, <laughs> you know. Oh no! I, I saw my, stars. I saw stars. <laughs> when I was little, my when we were whining, my mother'd say, "Stop your whinging." <laughs> the Irish That's accent. Right. Stop your bloody whinging. I was whinging, and um, I'm just like so happy I did it. It's he, he's like does such a beautiful. A job, you know. It looks great on your skin, really. And, and by the way, if you go on on Instagram, it's Northern Black, and you see all these different, um, you know, things. And he has books on the runes and all of the 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 uh, you, uh, Viking designs. I mean, he's fascinating, mm -hmm. and he he talks, he lectures, and uh, he's got a you know, it's like fuck off. <laughs> and then he like stops stops the tape. <laughs> he's so wonderful. Uh, Peter and uh, the the team he's got there is like a family, mm -hmm. and all this last time, all they were playing was a a band called Clone, that from the nineties, yeah, to the K, wow. and a band called Baroness. So they were playing Clone and Baroness nonstop, and you just get tranced into this kind of like, <sighs> like this kind of modern heavy metal kind of sound. I just loved it. And so uh, I just think about that moment and in time, and it's like magical for me. Mm -hmm. And every time I look at my tattoo, it just sends me back to being in that space with those loving people. And um, I just um, would encourage people to go make that pilgrimage. And yeah, and Deuce, I love that kind of also a celebration of a decade and and doing something that is so memorable like that to commemorate it. I love yeah. that. And you know how they used to say, well, if you get a tattoo when you're old, it's going to be nothing but a blob. Well, guess what? I'm old and it'll never fade <laughs> because I'll never get there. <laughs> it looks so good on your skin too. I, I'm not, oh, I like, thank you. I'm super, thank you. Yeah, I love it. Thank I love you. the hand. I love the hand. <laughs> the hand, the um, hand. As we were getting ready, he's like, hmm, I think you, you may need some of my skincare line. Like who doesn't have a skincare line? If you're going to be a celebrity on Instagram, you got to have a skincare line. Where could I use it? What I need the I feel like I you need the eye cream. I feel like I'm getting a little Well, you can use it anywhere. Oh, any okay. part of your body. <laughs> really? Yes. What and are there's the... a cream and there's an oil. It's called Vita Loca Skin Life and it'll we just got the domain name today. It's vitalocaskinlife.net. And it's going to be on Shopify and all that. You know that Brad Pitt has a skin line. Oh, like really high end and has the most beautiful bottle. You have to look it up. But, you know, the thing is, if you use his skin line, you end up looking like Brad Pitt. Oh, no. <laughs> oh, <how laughs> well, awful. that's what you're supposed to think, you know. And so if you use my skin line, this is what you end up looking like. Hot, yeah, hot, hot, hot hit maker. <laughs> Anything so, else you want to just hit on before we go besides? No, I mean, you know, it's just like. I'm so grateful for my life. I had it hard as a kid, but that's what made me strong. And that's what, you know, kept me living on a prayer. Aww. You didn't even plan that out. I love that. I love this. I love this man. He's amazing. Get the book. Get Desmond the book. Child, hit Get the maker. skincare line. There'll be more. Get the skincare line. If you look as haggard as me. I think that was the word he used before we said, Kelly, you look haggard. I did not say that. Would, I did not say, that. say that. I'm you like, might have thought that, but I never would say that to a gorgeous woman like you. I love you. Thank you for being on the podcast and many, many, many more years to come. Mm -hmm. Oh, the face, the face, the oh, face. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm.